welcome to this uh, one hour presentation and uh, the idea is that what I would like to do is just share some experience with you and where I can add value to your experience whatever in whatever capacity you you work or, or whatever capacity you need it really okay so um, welcome to this this workshop and for the next hour we're going to really just sort of focus on being adaptable I'd like to put this up as, a, as an opening slide just so that people can can read that I don't think there's any need to over on that and it would also be part of the information that I uh, give anyway so all I'd like to say is if we're going to get the most from the next hour I, I want to like you to be able to find it um, I don't expect you to believe everything that we talk about anyway take notes if you like um, I find that helps in remembering things. Also, we're going to do a couple of exercises that I'd like you to participate in. I'll just send out um, a video for people to watch before we do this, but if you haven't done that, that's absolutely fine, because we're, we're going to do it as part of the hour anyway. And, and finally, you know, once we've done this, there's going to be a set of resources you can access, and Alison can give you access to those and help you help you locate those um, once we finish. So there will be a record of what we've done. So who am I? Uh, what gives me the right to even have a conversation with you? Well, from my perspective, I spent 30 years in the Army Physical Training Corps and my job was really preparing people mentally and physically to do their role when it came to doing a job that no soldier ever really wants to do. Um, and, and, and during that phase, I designed my own approach, my own approach was really helping people to adapt when they were under situations that were highly pressured uh, and also for them to transition smoothly and, and at the same time become more resilient. Now I reckon that given the current situation with COVID that this has tested an awful lot of businesses. I know that certainly my business at the level of a couple of large contracts, they stopped just before COVID arrived. And I know that uh, without these skills that I use, I think I'd have been a little bit in, in, in a very interesting space. So I designed my own approach that, that, that really helps people make transition, helps them adapt and become more resilient as a result of that. And the, and the programs that I designed, I, I resigned my commission uh, in the Army Physical Training Corps and, uh, and delivered a lot of these to high level businesses, Fujitsu, Atlas, BMW, to name a few, Liquid Nets. Uh, and I did this all over the world. I also worked with elite sports. So I worked with international rugby, um, British skeleton, British fencing, uh, to name a few, Russian snowboard, uh, and, and really just working with performance at a, at a higher level. And then conversely, my, my experience you know, from the subject of the ridiculous insults that I've also used a lot of my programs with some very complex demographics. People like the police, military and, and, and high security prisons. I've lived in Europe and throughout Asia, so I do come from a very much a, a culturally aware mindset. And, um, and, and of course, working with mindset is the thing that's going to give us the edge in any situation anyway. So COVID-19 has had its impact, no doubt, on, on an awful lot of people. If we're looking at suicide rates and we're looking at a number of other things that are more mindset related. Um, and why would that be? Probably because mindset is, is the least understood component of performance. But certainly it has the most potential when it comes to um, gaining the edge. It is, it is the least studied and it is the least understood, but it certainly has the most potential if you harness it. So how many people really harness it in an effective way is the question. Well, certainly my experience with business and high performing environments is because those environments sometimes want something within a very, very short space of time. That's one of the reasons in high, perfor and in high performing sports that they sometimes have a challenge with anything that might be a, you know, a marathon as opposed to a sprint. But in businesses, I would say that, that, that it is now becoming a little bit more integrated, but certainly is not fully harnessed. So we looked at the word adaptable, and I, and I, I always like to sort of look at words in a little bit more detail. And, and I brought word, the word adaptable down into two words, adapt and able. Uh, and, and firstly, we, we might want to ask, well, if this is for leaders and managers, what is the difference? I think having spent a lot of time in high pressure environments myself, 
it's really important that we understand how our opera operating styles, how we need to switch those to get a different outcome. And so if you were to look at the definition of a leader, if you look at the statement a leader would use, it would be, follow me, I will show you how. And the reason that, that a leader might lead is because the people that they are leading don't necessarily have the knowledge and the skills or the attitude to achieve that outcome until they literally walk through that process and they, they gain greater understanding of it. So leading happens when people do not have the strategies or knowledge or skills to do something themselves. So follow me, I will show you is a great tenet of a leader. Um, if we talk about management, management is subtly different because a manager definitively speaking provides a framework for the employees, for their people uh, to achieve this, to achieve their goals. Uh, and they do that in a backdrop of equality and diversity. And if you think about those two definitions, they're dramatically different because one is getting involved and showing someone and the other one is actually providing a framework. So we can provide a framework for someone that has some knowledge, has some skills, and then we want them to evolve as a result of their experience. We can do that if we manage them. But as you can appreciate, if you don't know the difference between leadership, leadership and management, what happens is, is our roles become confused. Now, of course, these aren't the only two operating styles, because if you look at modern business these days, I would say that the, the, the four main ones that are used are leading, managing, coaching, and influencing. Uh, and we're going to talk about coaching later in our session. But the bottom line for, for a leader or a manager, when we start to talk about how we harness our own mindset, our own skill set, is that there's got to be some fundamental elements uh, to, to performance as a whole. So when I work with um, some of the rugby teams or some of the businesses, the first thing I do is break any performance down into a number of component parts. So what makes somebody able, and the first step in finding out if someone is able is you have to set a goal. That's the bottom line. So when the pressure is on, we, we, look, for a, we look for a strategy. And if we don't have a strategy, we tend to make things up as we go along. So having a strategy is really important. And the first part of, of that strategy should be to set a goal. And I'm sure most of the guys in this room will have done that, but they will have set a goal. I'm just letting a couple more people join us. Um, and of course, by setting a goal, it then shows us that if we have the knowledge, and the knowledge when we look at a component of performance is our ability to use facts and data to achieve that goal. And then if we look at the skill component of this, um, our skill, it, it, this is the ability to apply some tasks to achieve the goal as well. Now, knowledge and skill have to be separated because ultimately they're different components of any performance. And once we set the goal, if we can apply this knowledge of, and we can apply this skill and we've got the resources to achieve it, then that means that, uh, that, we, that, that we can produce behaviours that achieve that goal. Now, of course, people do set out to achieve things and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Because when, when we get to this point of performance, what we're saying is that this is more about adaptation. And I found that people can be able but actually, I work on the premise that not everyone sets out uh, to fail. People set out to achieve and something happens along the way. And so I'm more interested and was always interested. When I introduced performance coaching to the British Army in 2003, I found that, that performance coaching worked for about 60% of the people that I introduced it to. And these were people that had the capacity to adapt and were clearly able to achieve more. But, but I was always interested in the 40%. What stopped those people from adapting? Because what we also found is that we were losing some of our best people. They were self-sabotaging, they were giving up when we put them under small amounts of pressure. Because even though we believe as, as human beings that we are thinkers, even under small amounts of pressure, we revert to our emotional states. And, and you know, as we're gonna talk about in this presentation, all of our behaviours, everything that we do comes from our emotional mindset and how we harness emotions or, or how they impact on us. So I'm interested in what makes somebody adapt, what allows someone to adapt. And of course, the first component for, the, for this 
for adaptation is understanding your perspective, your, your, your perception. Later in this presentation, we are going to, um, we're going to look at beliefs and we're going to see how they impact. We're going to talk about personal power. We're going to talk about the law of requisite variety, being flexible. We're also going to talk about feedback and we're going to mention how we get outside of our frame. And I don't know if there are any coaches in the room at all, but if you've ever experienced performance coaching, it's a fantastic way of getting you out of your frame. The only time it becomes a little bit difficult is when um, you have things that have been holding you back for a considerable period of time. And we'll also talk about that. So let's talk about adaptation. Understanding your perspective, because, you know, if we just have a quick whistle stop tour into the world of psychology, it's a pretty much a recognized model that for every experience that you're having right now, that there's around about 2 million bits of information coming in through to your nervous system. Um, and th this is filtered. And, and this is filtered by, by our consciousness, if you like. And there are three filters of the mind that basically do this. And we're filtering this 2 million bits down to 134 bits by the process of deleting information. What does that mean? Well, if I asked you to pay attention to the little toe of your left foot right now, if I asked you to do that, um, you probably wasn't aware that your little toe was there until I draw your attention to it, until I put your attention to it. And then, but it's always been there, hasn't it? But you just weren't aware of it. And so this is an example of how we delete information. And we delete a tremendous amount of information. I mean, if you think about 2 million down to 134 bits, all of that 2 million is still gone into your nervous system, but you're only consciously aware of a very small amount of that, i.e. the 134. We also distort information because if I said to someone, you know, what is your, you know, who in the room is scared of snakes? I can guarantee that some people would put their hand up and some people would actually say, no, actually, I'm okay with snakes. If I said, are some people scared of heights? Some people put their hand up. Some people would say, no, I'm not scared of heights. And we could apply the same to meetings. We could apply the same to presentations. And so this is an example of distorting information. And we distort information the same way that we delete information because the mind can't really process that, the amount of sensory information that's, that's coming in all at once. We also generalize. And you'll even hear some of the generalizations around COVID already. The impact of mental health, the impact on, on businesses. Now, we generalize to save time, but we generalize based on our own worlds. And it's worth remembering that the people that, taught, that, that taught you how to delete, distort and generalize are the ones that got you to pay attention. So they're the people that you decided to follow or copy or pay attention to. So whoever was significant in your life that you copied, paid attention to, they were teaching you how to do all of these things. So if, you're, if you find that you're really successful in business because you've worked with somebody that's really successful, it's probably because that person is creating a bit of a model for you. Now, in, in, we won't really know um, what type of model we're following unless we do some of the things that we've talked about, which is set a goal and, and go out to achieve whatever it is we want to achieve. And the process of modeling has, has been out there a long time. We can actually copy effective models as well. So delete, distort and generalize. This is our, our, our mind's way of saying, right, we've got all of this information coming in and actually we're going to whittle that down to about 134, which is only a small percentage. So now we've got a little task for you. This is, this is, this is our first little exercise. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to um, take a look at this video and in a moment I'm going to invite people to shout out some numbers because what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to watch how many times the ball is bounced and how many times the ball is passed and I would like a combined total. So combined total of bounces and passes. Now because we've, we've only got a small number in the room, um, I'm only interested in the white shirts. So remember the task is this. And remember, you know, the thing is as well, we could put a bit of weight on this because, you know, if, if your Christmas bonus depended on this, I reckon you'd pay attention to this. So I want you to imagine that your Christmas bonus depends on, on getting this total right. And I'm interested in the numbers of bounces and the numbers of passes, a combined total of those two things. And I'm interested in the white shirts only. So that's your performance. Here we go.
Okay, now some of you may have seen this before and some of you may not have seen this before. What I'd like to now do now, if you can just shout out some numbers, is let me know how many bounces and passes, the grand total of bounces and passes. 14. How many? 14. 14, okay. So, so we've got a 14. Have we got any advances on 14? Well, I agree with Jackie, 14. 14, okay. So that's nowhere near the total, which is interesting. 20, 24. 24. Who said 24? That, that's, that's pretty close. But interesting, isn't it? So we've got, one, we've got two people saying 14 and one saying 24. So already there's a difference of opinions, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. So 14 and 24. Um, and did you notice anything at all, anything else at all about the video, Jackie? Um, in, what, in what respect? I was, I was too busy looking did at anyone, the book. So, so people that looked at the video, did everyone see the gorilla walk through the screen? Oh, yes, I did yeah, see yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And that's interesting, isn't it? Because um, it, it's interesting because basically, if we see the gorilla, there's a good chance we're going to get the number wrong. And no one's oh, got yeah, yeah. right distracted. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because the, the bottom the bottom line about this was, and by the way, when we really set this up and we put some pressure on people to perform, I would say ninety nine percent of people that haven't seen this video before, they missed the gorilla, mm -hmm. and they missed the gorilla for a reason because we've just said that our our perspective, our perspective, our per perception, is about one hundred thirty four bits of two million which is only a small percentage. So this is an example of how, if we miss the performance, then we, then we miss the performance, we miss the point. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I can guarantee if your life depended on those, on, on those numbers, it might also have a little bit of an impact on, on whether, whether or not we, we count the numbers and get them right, or, or whether we get the, the, you know, a, a wrong total. But what did I actually do? I set up the exercise to, do, to, to get you to delete, distort, and generalize. I only focused you on the white shirts and I gave you a performance, didn't I? So I want you to think about for a moment, we've already got different, I mean, and as a matter of interest, if you didn't see the gorilla in this footage and I was to say to you that there was a gorilla, would you believe me? Because the bottom line for this is that, um, our, our perception is is pretty limited in so much that we are, we're only going to pick up what, whatever we choose to focus on. And uh, in this instance, we pointed you towards the white shirts. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to uh, consider this for a moment because we've had people that have said there's 14 and we've had people said that there's 24 and I'm sure there's lots of different totals going on in the room right now. So who's right? And it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because if you didn't see the gorilla, and I tell you there's a gorilla in there, and you didn't see the gorilla, and I try to convince you that there is one, there's a good chance that you might not be convinced. So let's, let's see if we can uh, show you that again. And take a look at the gorilla. Now you could do this on a 30 foot screen and I've certainly done this with, with police forces, but you can see that, you know, for some people that didn't see the gorilla, they'll go, wow, how did I miss that? <laughs> well, the things that get us to admit that, you know, if you think about mindset, mindset is a little bit like this. If we were to give you a consequence, so think about COVID-19 at the moment. There's so much fear out there that people are not quite sure what to do and how to go about their daily lives even. And it's creating an awful lot of a reaction because the more we focus on one element like COVID-19, what we've got to be very mindful of is we might miss lots of different gorillas and those could be opportunities. So being in the right mindset is about creating opportunities. This was a, an experiment that was done by the, or a study that was done by the Illinois Laboratory of Cognition. And, and what this was about was, the question that was posed was, what makes somebody lucky in life? Well, in reality, you get what you focus on without blame or without judgment. 
So in reality, if, you're, if you spend life focused on the white shirts, whatever that is, I'm worried about a meeting, I'm worried about the future, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to achieve this, I don't think I can do that, the white shirts become your reality. And by the way, even though everyone else is seeing the gorilla, you're not seeing that happy gorilla. You're not seeing the opportunities. What you're actually seeing is, is, is your point of focus. So really important that we learn to uh, switch off and get a broader perspective on things. Certainly when I teach trainers and I teach coaches and, and certainly people that are going into dangerous environments, the first thing I, one of the first things I do with them is I show them how to relax, how to relax the vision so that they maintain context. And think about a business world, uh, about a business um, context. If we're so focused on not, not earning the money, we're so focused on not getting the sale, we're so focused on not achieving this, that then ends up coming into our space and being our reality, essentially. Just take a look at, um, at this. Because if we look at beliefs, you know, beliefs from my perspective, as we mentioned in one of the early slides, Beliefs are switches. Our emotions create our behavior, but the thing that switch our behaviors on or off is what we believe. And beliefs can either help us or they can stop us. ...that reveals this isn't always the case. Ba, ba, ba. Have a look at this. Ba, ba, what do you ba. hear? Ba. Ba, 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 ba. But look what ba, happens ba, when we change the picture. Ba, 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 ba. And yet, ba, the sound hasn't changed. In ba, every clip, ba, you are only ba, ever hearing ba, ba with a B. Ba, ba. Ba, it's an illusion ba, known as the McGurk ba, effect. Ba, Take another ba, look. Ba, Concentrate first ba, on the right of the screen. Ba, ba, now to the left ba, of the screen. Ba, ba, the illusion occurs ba, because what you are seeing clashes ba, with what ba, you are hearing. Ba. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ah. Uh, that reveals this isn't always the case. Okay, so, so what are the learnings from that? Well, one of the last words he said was what you believe you're hearing, what you believe you're experiencing. So you're not only seeing things, but you're going to hear things. And even what you see is going to influence everything else. After all, visual is probably um, the thing that triggers most of our experiences and reactions. You know, that's not totally true because other things can trigger things. But generally speaking, we trust our eyes uh, more than anything. And so what is the learning from that? Well, if our beliefs are switches, then our beliefs are either going to help us or they're going to hinder us. And empowering beliefs tend to be solution-focused beliefs. And so all you ever hearing in that, in that script all the time was bar with a B, with a bravo. And the rest is what we make up. So think now, I mean, I wonder when you contemplate COVID and you think about the situation with COVID, I wonder which beliefs kick in to help you. Which beliefs actually put you to the solution? Because, you know, when you have a mindset situation going on, the answers to a problem never lie in the problem. The answers to a problem always lie in, in everything that is not the problem and therefore the solution. Certainly having spent 30 years in the military, I can, I can assure you that I've attended some meetings where, where all we ever did was talk about the problem. And if you're not careful, the problem overtakes a situation. So we're going to say, okay, so if you, know, if you think of a situation that, that, that is probably challenging, what is going to be the thing that, that allows you to, to move away from that? Well, the first thing is going to be is to ask yourself, actually, instead of saying we can't or I can't, I'm going to start saying, well, how can I? And this will put us into a solution mindset. And of course, when we start working out the solution, 
the energy that comes with the solution is completely different to the energy that comes with the problem. A problem and energy tends to be all consuming. And people tend to want to keep going back to that. And you can use an awful lot of energy being problem focused. So if we talk about the thing that's going to move you on, that's going to help you during the situation that we're in, then we've got to have some sort of um, guidelines, if you like. And I would say that these, that the personal power comes from some things that I'm going to share with you now. Um, because gaining personal power, really, when you think about it, if we go through life believing that everything is happening to us, that's not really a very powerful place to be. And, and the thing is, we'll always have reasons for everything that we do. And reasons have a habit of turning into excuses when you hear the word but. I was going to do that, but. So the moment you start to hear but, we know that reasons are, are now going to turn into an excuse without blame or judgment, because some things can be tough. What we're going to say, though, that, that according to this frame, the cause and effect frame, that when people are on the effect side of this, this frame, they create reasons that turn into excuses, and, and basically things are now happening to them. We're more interested in being on the cause side of this, of this frame. Because if we're on the cause side of this frame, we can use our experience to learn and grow from and create something else. And part of being on the cause side of, of this frame is about recognizing that you create everything in your world and you take the blame frame out and, and get rid of it. Now, I know that's easier said than done with situations and things that can happen to us in life. But, but if we spend our world in blame, and generally speaking, we start to put with everything outside of ourselves. And that's a powerless place to enter. Because the more time we spend in reasons and excuses, the more that becomes our reality, that, the more it becomes our white shirts. And so forth, it, it then becomes more difficult to see anything outside of that. So we're interested in being on the cause side of this equation. That's the first step in personal power, by the way. Uh, and... Here's a, a few more things that I would say are really going to help you. You are 100% responsible for everything that you create. If you adopt this mentality, by the way, these are like convenient beliefs that if you were to adopt them, they will no doubt have an impact on everything that you do going forwards. Because if you are 100% responsible for everything that you create, you can create anything. You know, people underestimate the power of a thought. You know, the building that you're sat in right now, the environments that have been created around you all started with thoughts and ideas. So thoughts become things. Um, and I'm going to suggest that the moment you take 100% responsibility for everything that you create, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you get a level of personal power that allows you to create what it is you want. And I do believe that if you have the capacity, the reason why to do something, uh, uh, you know, there's an old saying in coaching that a big why will knock down any amount of how. So a big why will get rid of any amount of reasons why you can't if you push the why and you get the why moving. And of course, this is why at the start of any performance, you set a goal so that you, and you understand why it is you want to achieve that. The meaning of what you communicate is the reaction you get. Now, if you work with teams, if you work with teams, I'm just letting somebody else into the room, guys, just so that you know. One of the things with working with teams is because quite often we think that the message we give across is the message that was received. When we had go home rates in the army of something like 30%, I started to question the briefings that we were given and the impact that it had even on some of our best performers because we were losing some of our best performers. And of course, I didn't like that because we were, we were losing some great people and, and, and we brought them in and they really wanted a career and all of a sudden things changed. So the meaning of what you communicate is the reaction you get. Now, if you never measure that as a leader or a manager, if you never take feedback or validate your processes, and, and by the way, even the thought of that horrifies some leaders and managers, but if you're an authentic leader and you're confident in what you do and your knowledge is great and your skill level is great and your attitude's in the right place, guess what? You'll have no problem with feedback. You'll have no problem at all with feedback. So, because feedback is just information. So the meaning of what you communicate is the reaction you get. Measure it. The only way to measure that is to take feedback. And the only thing that stops you taking feedback is generally an ego. 
And, you know, I have an old saying that um, when ego comes into the door, care of consideration and um, reasonable thinking fly out of the window. So to be egoless is, is always going to be a skill. Now, actually, when you start to take responsibility for your performance and you take feedback, ego starts to disappear because you become authentic. You know, one of the things that you can, that I certainly used to measure young leaders by was, was how many personalities they used to create. When we put them under pressure, how they would produce a different personality in each space that even changed the way they talked. They, they changed the way that they communicated. And, and the bottom line for this is once you start to find out who you are, once you're prepared to introspect and, and, and take feedback and, and connect with your authentic self, that's going to be your greatest asset. So there is no failure. There is only feedback. If you enter into a, an exchange where you embrace the concept of learning, and it's all about learning. You're never too old to learn. You're never too clever to learn. So no failure, only feedback. And the bottom line is you get what you focus on. If you want to know the quality of your experience, take a look at the mirrors that are right, right in front of you. If I'm experiencing nothing but accident, tragedy, you know, without blame, if I'm experiencing um, poor returns of my investment of time and I can take ownership of all of everything that I've created, guess what? I now become a powerful thinker. But what some people do is they give up because emotions kick in and some of the common denominators for underperforming kick in and these can often steal our energy and so we lose energy and we give up. But actually, when you start to recognize that you get what you focus on, whether you meant it or not, and, and that the quality of what you're experiencing is basically the, the net result of your focus, these are really, really powerful ways to think. If I change what I do, guess what? I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to get something else. And so this takes us to not quite nicely to, to the law of requisite variety because for me, the person with the most behavioral uh, flexibility has the most influence in any situation. If you are literally a person that reacts to everything, if you can't take feedback, if you can't see a situation as an opportunity to learn, then there's a good chance you're not going to be very flexible. It's almost like you're a boxer walking into a boxing ring and all you have is a left jab. Now, someone with behavioral flexibility is someone that can flex their style. They can be a manager. They can be a leader. They can be a coach. They can be an influencer. They can be a confidant. So when you start to flex on that level, that is a person then that if they can flex their style, they can flex their tone, they can flex the words that they use given, it, given different situations, then this is a person that's going to have the greatest influence in any interaction. And of course, that is the law of requisite variety. How do we increase our flexibility? Well, if I was to say to you, let's give you a few minutes now. Um, if I was to say to you that you receive a piece of information that, that you don't necessarily like, COVID-19 is a perfect example of it. Before, just before COVID-19 COVID kicked in, I was working with a company called G's who want me to go in and, and do some one-to-one -one with their senior management teams and directors. And this was a significant piece of work for me because I've literally just returned from international rugby out in Asia. And, um, and so this was just getting me back into the groove and, and, and getting the approach that I've written, getting all of that put in order. And of course, then we get the bad news that COVID-19 is going to happen. No training is going to happen for at least the next three months. So I've now got a piece of information that I don't like. So I then get to choose, well, what am I going to do with this? What am I now going to do with my time between now and when they decide to train? Because this is one of the first clients that I've established. And, and of course, at this point, I get options. So, so imagine now that you've just been given a piece of information that you don't like. I want you to just write down three ways in which you can use it. You can either respond negatively to it or you can do some other things. And I want you to notice that if you use this as a little frame every time somebody gives you something that you don't like, this is a great way of improving your flexibility for dealing with something. And so you can also have, I mean, you don't necessarily need to complete this right now because I'm only going to give you a couple of minutes. But I mean, what are the benefits? Write down the benef benefits of everything that you're going to do. So if I do nothing, what are the benefits of that? What are the consequences of doing nothing? 
if I start to create something else, which is what, what I did was, it was the, the um, decider in me writing my book. So I decided to take this time out in lockdown to write my book. It was also an opportunity for me to develop a strategy that I've been thinking about for, for coaching young people, but teaching parents and teachers the concept of coaching so that they could coach their own children. So what are the benefits of these and what are the consequences? Now, when you start to use this as a little, a little model and, and you get used to using it, like all of these little frames, when you start to use them regularly, this has a natural impact on the routines that you create. So becoming behavior, behaviorally flexible, I would say, is going, to be one of your, is going to be one of your biggest assets. Now, of course, there are some models, um, and, and I've, I've worked with lots and lots of people with this particular model. And I will make these resources available to you in terms of a, of a document that you can use. But some of you might have used this before. So integrating feedback. You know, we talk about, about high-performing individuals and how we get the most out of a performance, but let's talk about feedback. Because there's an awful lot of information out there around feedback, and I've only really been interested in what accelerates human performance. And this is a model that I've used in lots of different environments. So, so traditional feedback models can often include what, what didn't go well. I, don't, I never include that. Why do I not include it? Because if you think about it, if you go back to one of the opening slides, we talked about how much information that you have um, available to produce a performance. And of course, from 2 million, we only get 134 bits that we can focus on. So here's a question. I'm, I'm presenting, darling. I'm presenting. There you go. There you go. You see what it's all presenting. <laughs> you love it, don't you? <laughs> um, so we've only got 134 bits to deal with. Now, now the, the, the thing is, you get what you focus on. And, and here's a question for you. Why would you rehearse anything that is not required? Why would you rehearse anything that's not required in the end performance? So you get what you focus on. So, and, and the bottom line is, if you've only got 134 bits of information to play with, why would you practice everything that you don't want? Because practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And whatever you practice the most, when we put you under pressure, I can guarantee will come into your performance. And then you'll get to a point where you start to even create lists of things that you don't want. And then you'll wonder why they pop up. So the bottom line is, if we only ever practice what's required, you know, when you look at the, the, the head coach of the British skeleton squad, Woody, um, here's a guy that I've mentored for a number of years. He's the, he's the only Winter Olympics coach to win seven consecutive gold medals, coaching different teams. And here's a guy basically that, that has applied what, this model um, because if we, if we consider what this model does, the first thing that it does is, you know, I, I don't know if anyone in the room has ever received feedback. You know, when somebody says to you, can I give you feedback? How many people sort of go, fantastic? Great opportunity to receive feedback, or do we get this little response on the inside, or just, or do you get a big response on the inside because some of the feedback that you've been given in the past actually has not necessarily served you? And of course, when we start to list what went well in a, in a feedback session, and by the way, feedback should be done as close to the performance stage as possible. So if you, the, the, the sooner you can do feedback, the more efficient it's going to be at the level of improving performance. If you look at um, international sport now, literally, you will be videoed whilst you're doing something and your coach will show you your video very, very quickly so that you can actually see your video and you can work with it in that moment. So, so when we start to ask and use this frame, the idea of asking what went well is to get rid of the mindset that on some levels you're being judged because when somebody gives you feedback, what happens is this, this has the potential to impact on your sense of self. Now, some people, and, and one thing that I tested in different arenas was that when some people get feedback, because we start to talk about what, would, what didn't go well and because we start to shift their mindset into a, a more emotional mindset, they don't, really, they don't even hear the other component parts of the feedback. They spend a lot of time worrying about what didn't go well. And then the rest doesn't necessarily go in. 
So what went well lifts someone's sense of self. And then from that, we then take, and, and, and this really is the skill in feedback. We're interested in now what will take it to the next level. We've got the self-image raised nice and high, and now we're in a position where they can hear us and we can talk to them. What will take it to the next level? And this is where we give them, if we're a subject matter expert or, or, or we are a mentor, uh, or we have knowledge of the, the situation, we can give them what we believe will take it to the next level. And then the last part of feedback is the installation of a, of a belief. So when you say to someone, you are, beliefs around I am type statements. So when somebody tells you I am not good enough, they tell you that they created a belief at some point in their life where they weren't good enough. So I am statements are beliefs. And beliefs are either going to help you or they're going to hinder you. So one quality you hold is, and this is where you give someone a very honest statement where you install, if you're an influential person, you install a belief. Now, it's really important feedback because it's your life source, essentially. As a performer, it's your life source. And as a manager, if you really want to harness a team, they've got to know how well they're doing. If you're a leader, they should know how well they're doing. You know, it's amazing that, that when you understand uh, that a compliment can go an awful long way as long as it's qualified. Uh, because people that don't have confidence, by the way, are people that, that have had conversations with, with, with others. I can guarantee that if you think about all the things, the beliefs that hold you back, the things that hold you back in life, I can guarantee that they were given to you by someone else. You just decided to believe them and act on them. So the power of language is, is, is you know, in itself is, is something that we've, we've got to respect as leaders. And there are whole you know, different types of trainings that we do where, where you can develop the power of language and you can understand all of its component parts. I mean, that's essentially is what coaching is all around. So if we look at this model here, we can use this with ourselves. Certainly when I think about one of the first trainings I did with the NHS, with a group of doctors and consultants, I realized actually that it was a very hierarchical environment. And of course, when I started to present to them, I wasn't training them the way that they were trained. So I didn't really... Um, understand why I was getting resistance in the room and of course after about an hour or so I, just, I've had, I had a chat with myself and I said what is going what is going well at the moment mate because I was losing a little bit of let's say enjoyment of that of that experience so I asked myself well what is going well and what will take it to the next level so I had a couple of chats with some of the doctors and they said well we normally work on case studies and I, I thought right that's the key so what will take it to the next level is if I start to talk about case studies that they could now connect with at the level of what they were familiar. And then from that, the session went, went a lot better. It wasn't the greatest session that I did, but every opportunity is an opportunity to learn, isn't it? And of course, feedback is the way to do that. Because if we don't have feedback and we don't have a structure to feedback, what people tend to do is they tend to make up their own stuff. And, and if, if, you're, if in history you've been trained on pain, then you're only ever likely to see the problems with what you've done. Because delete, distort, and generalize is, is, is how we filter our experience as a whole. And if you've been surrounded by people that basically train and, and act on pain, there's a good chance that that's what you might have copied. Now, if, you haven't, if you've never been trained on pain and you've been trained on pleasure, then there's a good chance if you meet someone that is trained on pain, you're gonna find that, that interaction pretty challenging. You know, I can, if I can think of the number of sports coaches that fear failure so much that they do some of the, some unbelievable things um, in, in terms of training sessions, pushing themselves beyond what they should be doing because of this fear. Now, is, is, there, such a, is there a problem with, with pain motivation or does it always have to be pleasure? No, it doesn't. As long as the pain is not burning you out. Because you can get to a point with, with pain-driven situations where, where that can happen. And of course, this, this feedback model is designed to keep you focused on where you're going. But this is really about focus. You only have 134 bits of it. So let's use the 134 bits to go, to go in the direction that we want to go. You could even think about a time when you underperformed. You can use this model to reflect on some of your past performances. And even in a performance that didn't go quite well, if you were to think of it and use this little session in your, on your own, you can do this in your own space, but ask yourself and force yourself to focus on what went well. I can guarantee 
there's always something that went well in that performance. And then even if you were to give yourself some advice and say, well, what would take it to the next level next time? And then give yourself a pat on the back for something that did go well. You can now start to, to sort of see that we're either going to be in a limited mindset or we're going to be in an empowering mindset. So this is a lovely little system for developing your performance very, very quickly. I've taught people to ski. I've taught people to present. I've taught people to hold meetings just using this simple tool. And, and, and I'm a great believer that when, when the flak is flying, when the pressure is on, simple is always best. Stick to something that's really simple because they're the things that are effective and they're the things that are more, more likely to work and they're easy to remember. So that, that's feedback. And feedback is certainly the start of a journey, whereas if we look at failure, failure is definitely the end of one. And, and I firmly do not believe that anyone fails on any level because you've always got something to work towards with, with a great model like this. Okay, so let, let's talk how we get out of our frame of thinking because earlier in the slides we talked about how we were going to talk about beliefs and we were going to talk about perception and how that impacts on our, on our world. Now, if you think about it, delete, distort and generalize. So for every conversation that I'm holding with you right now, I can guarantee that on the inside of your mind, you're comparing and contrasting whatever I talk about with other things in your life, comparing it to this and comparing it to that because we all do that, by the way. And what you end up with on the inside is you end up with images, you end up with sounds, you end up with feelings or sensations, and you end up with self-talk. And of course, these are all the component parts of delete, distort, and generalize. We've got smells and we've got tastes as well. But essentially, we delete, distort, and generalize, and we come up with, with our frame of thinking. So why was performance coaching so effective with people? Because people find it pretty impossible to get out of their own frame. So when someone asks you questions outside of your frame, a coach, the idea is that what's happening is they're forcing you to go inside. They're forcing you to reevaluate things. They're forcing you to think outside of your frame. So if you're in a problem mindset, you might not even see the gorilla. If you're focused on the white shirts, the, the, the gorilla might be dancing past. The gorilla could be a great opportunity that you can't see because you're locked within this frame of thinking. When people present ideas, even an idea that we write or that an employee writes, can, if they present this idea to you, it will still be full of deletions, distortions, and generalizations based on their model of the world, based on, on, on their way of thinking, their, their way of, of understanding the world. And you know, one of the things that you, uh, that you recognize with performance coaching is that everyone is a completely unique individual. And performance coaching is about getting through the deletions, the distortions, and the generalizations, getting down to deep structure, getting down to what is, what is underneath all of that. Um, and of course, if you're involved in a problem and somebody starts to ask you questions around the solution, sometimes it's difficult getting people out of the problem because they're drawn to it. But performance coaching is great for doing that, as long as the problem is not too juicy. You know, we talked about the military guys and we said, well, we introduced performance coaching in 2003 and 60% of those guys, we could performance coach very, very quickly. But the 40%, we couldn't. The 40% the, the kept repeating all patterns. What that showed me was that um, when someone has created a lot of emotional stuff in their past, it's the emotional stuff that creates some of the negative patterns. It's almost like... I'm driving my car and I'm looking through the windscreen, but actually because my past is so heavy emotionally, my rear view mirror is as big as my windscreen. And so the idea of performance coaching is to get you beyond your rear view mirror and get you going into the future. Um, when that doesn't happen, it's because as I said, that there might be some juicy things that are hanging around emotionally in a person's past. And of course, that's where we go into the world of transition coaching. So there's a whole spectrum of coaching really. Um, so a coach asks you questions to get you outside of your frame of thinking. Now what this naturally does when you're asked questions is it raises awareness. So it raises your awareness and you have what is known as light bulb moments. When coaches talk about light bulb moments, what they're saying is that I've just been asked a question because I'm in my current mindset and, and my coach has just asked me a couple of questions 
that literally has got me to think of this from a completely different perspective. But I'm the one coming up with all of my answers. And as a coachee, there is nothing, there is nothing more powerful than you coming up with one of your own resources because for you that is meaningful. And that essentially is the essence of performance coaching. So what we're doing is we're taking someone, if you think about the cause and effect frame, someone that's telling you that things are happening to them, they're powerless, they're not good enough, they can't do this. And what you're doing is directly challenging that frame and you're moving them to cause. And that's one of the jobs of a coach. The job of a coach is to give you personal power, to, for you to understand that in reality, this, this frame is created by a state of mind, which is generally emotional. And essentially, that's the essence of coaching. Now, un unless I don't know if any of you guys in the room have experienced coaching, but if you find that you've experienced performance coaching and it hasn't worked, I can guarantee that there'll be some, something emotional holding that performance back. And, and that's where we go into the world of transition coaching. Transition coaching is about, is about taking what you believe about yourself, how you emote, and, and your identity when you're doing those, and, and changing your relationship with the experiences that have, that have created those. So that's what transition coaching is about. And we don't talk about it too much in this because we're more interested in, in some of the practical things that we can do pretty quickly. So what if, what if we were to contemplate some of the little exercises that we've done? What if we were to um, improve our behavioral flexibility by when we get given something negative, we think of three ways in which we can use it and we recognize that the answer never lies in a problem. The answer actually lies in the solution. What if we were to understand that we create everything without blame and we were to let go of blame? Because blame makes you move outside of yourself and you lose power. Because the thing is with, with some of these concepts, with the, with the feedback, you know, what if we were to understand that feedback actually is more about what we focus on? And in life, we get what we focus on, whether we meant to do it or not. And equally, whatever we focus on, we pass on to others. So if we believe a certain thing and we've never really had our beliefs challenged, there's a good chance that what we believe, we're going to pass on to others. And they will then delete, distort, and generalize, especially if you're influential, and they will focus on whatever you get them to focus on. So remember, if you're only ever focused on the pain of a situation, then there's a good chance that's what you're going to get. If you only ever focus on the solution of a, program, uh, of, a, of a problem, or the solution connected to it, or the positive connected to it, there's a good chance that's what you're going to get. And if you don't get that, it's probably because you're not using systems that allow your mindset to put you onto the solution. I think that whatever you do when, when you're investing in yourself, I think that spreads to the team. And then you can measure that by the meaning of your communication. If I want to know the meaning of my communication, I will simply ask somebody, what is your take on what I've just said to you? You know, just so that I can get some understanding of this. What is your understanding of this message? And you would be amazed if you, you know, just, and you can try this out with each other, with people that you, you trust and know. Have a little chat with them and, and, and come up with a concept and then ask them what they believe their interpretation of your concept is. And you'd be amazed how sometimes they'll come be literally polar opposites. And what you intended to communicate is not necessarily the way it was received. Your greatest power is going to be, is going to include that. It's going to include that as part of your system. And, and the bottom line is that if you start to own your world, you take ownership, then you can be focused on, on the return of the investment of energy that you give to the people that you want to, to develop. Now, I've got some resources that, that I want to share with you. I'm mindful now that we're on 1101 hours. Um, I've got some resources and, and you know, I'm more than happy to take some questions if anyone has any questions. You've got Alison's contact details on one of the slides, which you'll get. And you've also got mine in case you want to make contact with me individually. I'm sure you can do that. Okay. So I think that's us, that's us for now. I think you know what to do from here forwards. And I think, you know, we've got a look forward to high pressure, low stress on the 2nd of June. Coming out of lockdown, a practical HR guide, 4th of June.